Helena Bugallo and Amy Williams of the Bugallo Williams duo are joining me backstage at Le Poisson Rouge. We're in the green room where they've just finished rehearsing for their concert tonight to celebrate Nancaro's 100th birthday this fall. They've recorded a handful of albums, including Nancaro's complete music for piano duet and solo piano. In their 17 years together, they've explored an enormous range of contemporary music, extended techniques, collaborations with composers, conductors, and chamber musicians. WWFM would like to welcome you to our audience. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. So the first question to ask, um, since you're playing a concert that has so much Nankuro and celebrates his, his 100th birthday, he is most famous for writing for player piano, which is essentially a machine reading notes off of a, a punch card score. Why should a live performer tackle this music in the first place? That's a very good question and one we've thought quite a lot about when we started this project oh, in 1998. Um, so it's, his music is with us for 15 years. Yeah. So it's another yeah. anniversary. Right, right. Um, we, uh, we discovered this music and um, particularly a few arrangements of, the, of his player piano studies that were written for piano for hands, one piece, and for ensemble by our teacher, Ivar Mikashev. And Ivar worked very closely with Nankara once he started writing again for human beings in the 1980s. Um, Nankara wrote his tango for solo piano for Ivar. And Ivar first arranged uh, Nankara's Sonatina, which is an early solo piano piece that is so monstrously difficult for one player that Ivar arranged it for piano four hands. And though it's still quite challenging, it is much more playable in that medium. And so Nankara actually was able to hear his piece played by live performers as he intended it on one, one piano, and um, was very pleased with that. He was very pleased with the sound of the piece and, and the fact that human beings were interpreting it you know, as he had intended. And so uh, then Ivar arranged some of these pieces for ensemble and also study number 15 for piano four hands. And with this process, we thought we fell in love with the music. We just thought it was incredible. And we were searching as we were starting out as a piano duo for pieces for piano four hands. We didn't find a lot of wonderful repertoire for four hands, contemporary repertoire, many pedagogical pieces um, and uh, many arrangements. But we were looking for something kind of unique and fresh for the piano duet. And um, we found this study that Ivar had arranged and wondered, ah, I wonder if there, it was so, you know, so, so original and um, certainly not pianistic, but, but, but just really compelling music on one piano. And so we started looking into the studies and um, worked with the composer Eric Onya and the three of us have uh, arranged 12 more studies for piano duet after that point. And the process just kind of snowballed and got larger and larger. And so we arranged uh, one for two pianos, one for two pianos, eight hands, and, but the bulk of them are for piano duet because that was how Nancaro heard the, the pieces coming out of one single instrument. And so we decided to do as many as we could for that particular medium. Um, and so uh, why? Because the music is incredible and because the music, if you hear it performed by live musicians, it, it speaks to people in a different way than um, the very particular sound of Nancaro's pianos. Um, and the, the, the mechanistic quality of the roles, they allow for some interpretation, some human element that makes them, um, that makes them come alive again. And so it's really been um, an incredible experience for us to play these pieces and to share them with people because they really, people really do uh, respond to them. Uh, the music is very direct and very clear and yet very complex at the same time. And, yeah. Where, um, when you're approaching the score, I mean, are there actually published notes, like there stab, are. musical stabs? There and are, yeah. Do you ever go back to the original text and look at the, the you know, the paper itself and the durations of the, the, the holes and things yeah. like that? Yeah, yes. Um, we have uh, worked in principle with the scores which are published, but sometimes uh, some questions come up. For example, you listen to the uh, to look at the score and listen to a recording of a role, and there are some things that don't coincide. So the question is a um, scientific question: which one is right? Um, and well, one, one tends to think the role is right because he 
finally punched it in a roll and hurried it away. Right. So, and this is, um, and took many decisions at the very end when he punched the roll. It's a compositional decision. So we, we try to go by the roll most of the times. Um, sometimes it's not possible to transcribe from the scores, l like in the case of study number 20. Why not? Because it's a study on durations. And the way he notated these durations is by writing the head of note and a line only. He doesn't write a half note or a quarter note. So it's a proportional study. Um, unless you have the original manuscript where these lines uh, have very specific durations with small subdivisions, and you can see how long they are. So you can go how to many the holes. Yeah, you can go to the roll and count the holes and know exactly how long these notes are. And this was the process with study number 20, which we play. We won't play tonight, but we'll, we play also. Um, and another, another comment about the, your original question, why playing this music uh, the, that was conceived and written for the player piano? Maybe this is not so well known, but um, the relationship between his instrumental music, to music for people, and his player piano music is more fluid than one may think. Uh, there is the uh, early pieces he wrote for performers, many of which he couldn't hear at the time because uh, there was either no interest or they were too hard or right. he, he wasn't the type of character who would go and sell his music out right. at all. Well, and um, he said that he, did, he didn't set out to write music for player piano, but he set out to write his, to write his own music and it was just too hard. Exactly, exactly. Um, so he was dissatisfied with that and started working on the player piano, found an incredible partner on the player piano, reliable, <laughs> rhythmically <laughs> accurate, and Nothing always there fast. for him, <laughs> except when it got broken. But yeah. And um, he was also not a very social person, so in privacy he could write the music and hear it in his piano. Um, and so many of these pieces, early pieces he actually arranged for the player piano in order to hear them. So this is the first step, from uh, music for performers to the player piano. Um, and then the player piano uh, allowed him to do many things that um, were impossible for performers, and he went in that direction with the instrument, 30 years of just working with this instrument. And at the end, when he was asked to write for performers again, very well known performance at Diti Quartet, Ursula Opp, and Silva Mikhaishov. Um, he was so attached to the player piano that he, the, in almost all the cases, the pieces come from early player piano pieces. Really? So he actually rearranged many of the late works um, Starting from the player piano work. So knowingly, was, were these was he? Yeah, knowingly, know? as research advances, people realize, ha, huh, they come from the player piano. He, he and the player piano were uh, working together, <laughs> um, and this is the way he he, he approached composition. So it it so doesn't seem so unnatural to go back to the studies and say, well, these thirteen pieces are playable. Let's try them out. Um, as he also himself did it. Oh, study number 26 he arranged for four piano for seven pianos. hands. Yeah. <laughs> because the, the piece has seven voices of seven hands. Um, and other pieces he also arranged himself. Not so many, but it was not an idea that he found so uh, foreign. Right. And when he started really delving into the player piano world, that was when he had gone to Mexico, leaving the States in the 40s because of um, anti-communist sentiment. Do you guys, after working so closely with this music, I mean, this is a general question, but do you perceive him to be somehow Mexican or more American or why? I mean, what, what's your, in your heart, what do you feel this music is, is coming from? Because it's so different from anything else. Um, I, I would say... Uh, the feeling, the, the connection to the American experimental music tradition is very strong. Henry Cowell was the person who got him started, who mentioned the idea of player piano and the idea of focusing on uh, 
rhythms, polyrhythms at d different speeds, and that we should develop our rhythmic language. Um, and so it, it was really Cowell's book, New Musical Resources, that was kind of the Bible for Nancaro. And he felt very much, I mean, I don't know how he felt, but, but I, I see him now very much a part of the experimental American tradition. Um, and the kind of, um, like a Harry Parch or something, a kind of figure who just did his thing and didn't matter what anybody else thought. And, you know, like he was out in the West, just, just a, you know, a pioneer or a maverick, that kind of feeling is certainly there with Nancaro. He happened to be in Mexico. I, I, although he was connected um, to some musicians in Mexico, he was also very connected to visual artists there. Um, but there's all this talk of Nancaro being isolated, but he was not isolated. He had an enormous record collection of world music, Indian music, African music, contemporary, the latest, whatever was being made. He had it and he was listening to it and he had a huge book collection and he subscribed to all the music journals and other journals. And so he was extremely connected to intellectually, musically, cultural, what was going on in the world. So it's not that he was in isolation really because he just wasn't uh, personally in contact but he was very much um, aware of what was going on all around the world, and so, um, so I think his music shows many different influences because no, because jazz, of that. It's jazz, very very strong. I think his music, yeah, and um, Mexican or American, I don't know. He's, he's Nancaro, <laughs> but he's um, um, just. Um, Extremely influenced by Barto, for example. Really? In a way, yeah. How so, specifically? Was it the How folk so influences? The folk influences, the rhythmic writing, in a way, this additive uh, thinking uh, about rhythm uh, model, the exploration of modes, he, uh, model music, he's also into that. Maybe these large forms that were kind of yeah. preconceived large formal structures. Um, so certain each, dryness each, in the music, I yeah. think, too. Each canon has a, a very distinctive shape that's determined by the, the different speed relationships, yeah. and that's all worked out ahead of time. Right, and uh, canons, I mean, most of our listeners will identify or associate canons with the children's songs. There's a melody that repeats. Yeah. And it's sure, row, row, row your boat. Or right, it's a very Parashat, simple yeah. idea. Yeah. And Nankaro took it to the extreme, um, with with these you know these complicated numeric ratios and isorhythms made it very complicated, but how do you approach that musically? Since since now as as performers you sort of have responsibility. You're you're taking on these different tempos, and you're trying to express something. What is it? Well, the canons allow him to express something else. It was almost like a way to get into this multi-tempo uh, experience that he wanted in his music. A canon allows him to uh, articulate this multi-tempo expression um, idea because you hear a melody or a harmonized tune or a series of chords and then you hear them repeated them in a different tempo and you make the connection. So he was actually more interested in this connection than in the canon itself and being imitative. Um, and the, the relationships, the temporal relationship can be as simple as two to three uh, and they, they can go up, up to 60 to 61. So almost almost the same tempo but not quite yet. And then you, you have a canon. So the machine can do that, we, we cannot. cannot. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Well, can I ask you then my next question? I don't want to, yeah. I want you to finish your thought, but in, this, in the more complex you know, tempo relations, what do yeah. you do? Do you use a click track on stage? Or? No, yeah. no. We, um, probably the most complex tempo canon we do is 12, 19. study number 19, which is the tempo relationship of 12 to 15 to 20 and three voices at those three speeds. And, um, and just, just for our listeners and audience at home, that's very complicated. That's very, that's complicated. very complicated. complicated. And the way that we had to work it out was to sort of figure out what was shared between the two of us. And there was one voice, because there are three voices, so there's one voice that's shared. And because we, have, we are two brains, and so we have to stay connected to each other, and so the shared voice is the one that we stay connected to it, and then we each play a voice against that one, right? 
And so um, with something like that, that shared voice has a pulse that's extremely fast. And so it required starting very, very slowly and working out exactly the composite, what it's supposed to sound like. And eventually, one click at a time, getting faster and faster, you start to hear the result and know what the result is. Um, so it's like any music. I mean, you just start really it, slow, and you and you slowly. work your way you work your way up. Uh, with Nankaro's music, there are some studies like Nineteen that that really the the expressive part of it is not expressive. You really have to play exactly what's written, keep it together, keep it tight, and it kind of expresses itself in a way. But there are other studies that really are uh, lyrical and uh, tunes and jazzy and bluesy. And so those allow us to learn the notes and the rhythms, but then move beyond that to interpret the pieces a little bit. And though we, we keep the rhythms accurate and we, you know, we do the tempo he wrote um, and play all the notes exactly, but there, there is a certain level of phrasing, of articulation, of dynamics. He didn't write in a lot of dynamics in his music um, that the music allows as for. for in a way, yeah. yeah. But the canals are the opposite. If if one gets a little bit of this strictness of rhythm, the piece falls, falls apart. Yeah. The pieces are about this this acceleration that the the, the different tempi give. And if if it's not played accurately, um, it, the piece doesn't exist. <laughs> so it, it's, yeah. it's like um, walking on a on a thin rope. Yeah. It's, um, so it feels, as an interpreter with two people, often we talk about this ex experience, which is very particular to this music, of listening to the other person, but also not listening. Because if you listen too much, you get pulled into their tempo, right? If you, if you try to sing row, row, row Your Boat with somebody else at slightly different speeds, it's, it's quite hard, right? You, you start to speed up with the other person, and so you have to Stay at your own speed and not be too influenced by the other person, but also be aware of what the composite result is so that it, it's accurate. Right, so, so, it's um, so it's a very interesting and experience. And making this, this polytempos uh, performable, playable, is part of the, the art of the transcription itself uh, that, we, that we played. Because he wrote different tempi, tempo 20 for one line and tempo 15 for the other. The machine could do it. No problem as long as the, the holes are proportionally punched. Uh, but for a performer, it's not not practical <laughs> practical this way. So the transcriptions are usually written in one tempo, and then we use rhythmic writing, different figurations to write a different tempo to express a different tempi. Mm. But we have to have some. So that we Common share ground. a bar line. We feel that bar line, even though we don't play it accented in any way, we feel that common bar line. So, so that's something that's, that's transit transit behind the scenes a little bit. Right. Like exactly. As a live performer, you need to sort of impose. Right, yeah. We need to stay connected to each other yeah. right. in a way that obviously the machine doesn't. When you're, when you're thinking about interpretation, or, or it's, it's, it's sort of new territory that you're doing, because there's not a whole lot of recorded um, live performances of his work, right? Did you go to listen um, to the jazz pianist? I mean, he's, he's quoted as liking, um, I think, Art Tatum and Earl Hines mm -hmm, as, yeah. as, you know, as the, the jazz pianist that he loved. Did you listen to their music in order to inform your performance number three? I was quite familiar with Art Tatum's piece, and actually one of the pieces of mine we're doing on the program is very influenced by Art Tatum. So I think that was just sort of something we knew of as pianists and, and just being interested in music in general. So we didn't specifically listen to it saying, hmm, I wonder what Nan Caro was influenced by. But, um, but you know, certainly an awareness of that music helps understand how to interpret it. And you know, because he was trying to capture some of the subtle rhythmic playfulness and, and detail of jazz musicians. And he was trying to capture that by writing extremely precise Right, Rhythms, by notating you know. what they were doing, yeah, Trans right. transcribing their right. work in, in a some way. ways. Yeah. So uh, what is uh, very curious, I think, is these these musicians he admires so much, uh, and their music, uh, pianists in particular. That there is such a strong physical element in what they do, 
um, the pieces and the improvised part of also and um, and in the case of Mancaro it's music without physicality <laughs> there is no person playing but he's taking these um, gestures and um, effort and virtu virtuosistic uh, type of playing mm. but abstracted with no 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 body playing them right right yeah. That's interesting. Do you guys have certain warm-ups that you do if, say, you're playing an all-Nan Crow program versus oh. other contemporary music? Try to stay Just focused. Try to stay it's, focused. Like it's a mental <laughs> game, huh? Yeah, at this point, it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the, as Elena said, the pieces can sort of, they're always fragile. They can you can if you just the tempos get a little bit messed up the whole thing falls apart so even though we've been playing this music for a very long time it's always challenging and you have to stay focused in a in a very different way than if you're playing music that was actually written for the piano yes we often did this program this 13 and Caro studies and second half is uh, Stravinsky Rite of Spring and the Rite of Spring feels Oh, you just can <laughs> play because he wrote at the piano, so every chord fits into the hands, and right. and with Nankar, nothing fits into the hands. It is a relief. Yeah, yeah right. it's a very different feeling. Very different. Has has work on Nankar uh, influenced um, how you come back now to other contemporary music? I mean, obviously Stravinsky, and I assume that your as your work as a composer, mm -hmm. Amy, it, mm -hmm. it's influenced you. But sure, I would say very much in the sense that when we first started. The first few studies that we learned, these tempo relationships of three to four to five, three to four, I think, um, for, were it was ex extremely difficult for us because we didn't have the rhythmic technique developed. Uh, we didn't, we hadn't trained polyrhythms and you know practicing playing at different speeds and these kinds of, of things and, and knowing really internally what these. Um, what these polyrhythms are. So it was, you know, we really had to learn that. And, we, and, and now when we take a new contemporary piece and the whole thing's four against five, it's like, yeah, whatever, four against five, we can do that. Because we've just developed this, this rhythmic technique over time. And so they've, they've really helped a lot with that, definitely. How do you th how do you think his work is? We're going to look back and reflect on how it's it's changed, and and especially because now you're, you're taking his technology and making it live. That's an interesting, hard to predict the future. You know, I think um, the amount of transcriptions that have um, appeared in the past few years shows that his music goes beyond the medium. That is an interest, genuine interest in what he did beyond the player piano. His music because of him is in a way, um, in a Bachian way. Um, so music that works well in different um, media and, and uh, is incorporated, is flexible enough to be incorporated. Um, yeah, technology. I think his, I think his compositional voice is so unique that um, that that history will remember that because because it really is um, completely imaginative, completely focused and singular. Uh, he he didn't have a early period and a late period. It was just this straight line of development, and um, you know such such a such a special uh, voice and vocabulary that he developed, and and I think that that really will last because because it's it's so unique so i think uh i think he'll be remembered yeah for, for sure a long time well and amy uh, just one more question you you have two pieces that we're hearing of yours on yeah. this program what how are those going to contrast against the the nan that we're yeah listening? i think the the abstracted art has certainly uh through the lens of jazz has a connection to to nan caro um, I think also through playing Nankar's pieces and just playing more and more forehand repertoire, we really um, we uh, approach this medium of piano forehands in a special way, visually, choreo choreographically. Um, and so both of my pieces, I think, um, take advantage of of everything that you can do with two people, not everything, but many things that you can do with two people at one piano. There's no longer the idea that, you know, uh, like if you're playing a Mozart piano duet, the person on the top stops at middle C and the person below stops at middle C. There's really the whole instrument is, is there to, to
to be played. And um, so many of the studies require quite a lot of, of chore choreography and um, interaction and uh, the four hands all in one register or spanning the whole instrument. And so I really, I think I was influenced by that experience of, um, of doing so much four hand repertoire together that the pieces show a lot of that. Um, Crossings is, is inspired by Bach really very directly. I mean, it, it takes a Bach chorale and kind of uses that as a very slow framework to build the rest of the piece. Um, and Nancaro was profoundly influenced by Bach. So, you know, there are different um, perspectives of sort of different ways of looking at the same thing in some ways. So I think that there's a, a clear connection with, with Nancaro with music. And, in, especially when I write for piano four hands. So we'll, we'll hear some Bach, even though he's not on the program. You tonight. will hear Bach also. <laughs> there are um, Bach transcriptions by Georgi Kurtag will play on the program. Yeah. Oh, great. So um, there are arrangements of Bach and then interspersed with original pieces by Kurtag. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of, of Bach running through the whole program. And then yeah, some Stravinsky. Stravinsky. Stravinsky was probably one of the most uh, influential composers for Nancaro. Um, and so, yeah, there are definitely threads that connect all of the pieces to each other and, and to Nancaro. Great. Well, it's a fantastic program. I think the audience is going to love it tonight. Um, Elena Bugalo and Amy Williams, thank you so much for being with us today. And, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we look thank forward you. to the concert. Yeah, great. We do, too. Thanks.